How's everybody doing? How's Cosmoverse? Sorry, sorry. How is Cosmoverse? It's those mid-afternoon slots that they always give me where I'm just like the hype man. They know I drink my coffee right before. Who was at Cosmoverse Lisbon and heard my talk on privacy? Ooh, so we got a new crowd. Maybe I should have run it back. I wanted to do something new because I figured all you amazing Cosmoverse participants, maybe you were in Lisbon, you heard me talk a lot about privacy more as a human right, as a concept, less so as a technology that we've implemented in the Cosmosphere. Uh, so this is more about the history of Secret itself and the fight for Web3 privacy, what we've been doing across the whole history of the project. If you missed that talk in Lisbon, just remember that privacy has a lot more to do with things that aren't just keeping things hidden from other people. Really, it is a cornerstone for things like consent, for things like human freedom and empowerment, for things like sustainability. So keep all that in mind as we go through the history of the project, then what's happening now, what's going to happen for Secret and for the cosmos in the future. Our one mission has never changed. For the project in all of its iterations with all of its communities, we believe that decentralization to work, to truly be empowering, is going to require strong privacy guarantees for users. But if you reverse that, we also believe that strong privacy technologies are going to need to be decentralized. They're going to be needing to be in the hands of users, not gate kept by any particular organization, but they have to be in the hands of the users and operated globally to be sustainable and to be empowering. So we'll start with the then, we'll go to the now, but privacy will always be our mission and fundamentally it's because of those things that we believe, that decentralization requires privacy to succeed, but privacy will equally require decentralization to become sustainable. We're going back to 2015. People who aren't familiar with the history of Secret as a project may not know that there are these very deep roots for the ecosystem, for the research behind the ecosystem. At 2015, I was a graduate student at MIT, but not one of the smart ones. I was in the business school, which fortunately gave me a lot of exposure to ideas that were bleeding edge and probably about a half a decade ahead of their time. One of which was this paper called Decentralizing Privacy. And that was written by Guy Ziskind, who's the CEO of Secret Labs and has been building out this ecosystem as long as there's been an ecosystem to build. And this was foundational research. It was the first paper to really describe how privacy technologies could be combined with blockchain technology, two kind of bleeding edge areas of research, to create something that had never existed, something that was decentralized and also private. And you'll notice some things from this paper that now seem, you know, extremely prescient. Unlike Bitcoin, transactions in this proposed system are not strictly financial. They could be used to carry instructions, such as storing, querying, sharing data. And we discuss possible future extensions to blockchains that could harness them into a well-rounded solution for trusted computed problems in society. My favorite part of that sentence is where we mention society. Like, this was meant to be used for solving actual problems, not problems of speculation, not, you know, casino games, but we really believed that privacy technologies combined with decentralization could revolutionize everything and that they should. Also in 2015, this little network called Ethereum launched. And when I was doing my graduate research, I was doing digital rights management with blockchain research. And a lot of the things that I was looking into were not Ethereum. I was like, we're going to solve this with colored coins. That was for, for people who remember. And it turns out the only thing I wrote about that actually started to be used for all the things I thought was Ethereum. At the time, you know, it was revolutionary, solving for this idea of programmability on the blockchain, going beyond Bitcoin. But everything was still public by default. There was no consideration of privacy. And this was happening at the same time that this very first white paper was being written. A white paper that now has, I think, over 3,000 academic citations. So that white paper became this, became Enigma in 2017. And at the time, because Ethereum was what was live, the white paper was about combining multi-party computation with Bitcoin. But Enigma was about taking pragmatic privacy solutions to market with the Ethereum blockchain to create this private compute vision that we had written about. And this was supposed to be solving for Ethereum specifically. It was being developed as a layer two. And the main privacy technology that was being researched 
Then for production, the only thing that was really production ready was using secure hardware, a trusted enclave model, which was the best available technology in terms of performance, in terms of cost, generalizability, all the things that we were trying to value to create pragmatic solutions that would be used in production. But it still was clearly going to be somewhat limited relative to our very lofty vision for the future. Finally, we get some good tech. The Cosmos Hub launches, and now suddenly proof of stake is a thing. So now suddenly we're thinking differently about what's possible with blockchain beyond the proof of work model. And we get closer to this internet of blockchains reality. The idea that there will be this multi-chain future, that there will not be this one you know, chain to rule them all, but there will be many chains solving many things. And as a project that knew what we were trying to solve, we knew we were trying to solve privacy, it was essential for us to find a way to be part of a multi-chain vision. And it became clear that there were visions possible beyond Ethereum. And in this initial Cosmos vision, while there was all this power, there was still, just like Ethereum, no privacy. But suddenly all the pieces are in place for what we're describing, this idea that we need decentralization, we need privacy, and they need each other. So we have privacy by default, we have the idea of programmability, and self-sovereignty as a layer one, and interoperability, and this is the idea that added up to Secret Network. The idea of a privacy hub for all of Web3 that would solve this universal privacy problem that every blockchain shared because they were all using the same public by default model. We believed we could build a hub that could solve this problem for all chains and not just our own ecosystem. So that's why we came to the Cosmos in 2020. And again, this is, this is now starting to become recent history as much as it's ancient history. We were one of the very first chains to migrate from this Ethereum ecosystem to commit to the Cosmos ecosystem, to commit to this vision of interoperability while maintaining self-sovereignty because we knew that that was the path to reaching ultimately that big equation that I just put up, to have all of these things in one network but connecting to all others. February, we launched the mainnet. September, we got private smart contracts on mainnet, the first network to do so. And then we were also the first network to get Cosmwasm smart contracts onto the mainnet, running inside this enclave. We, I like to say we left ETH before it was cool. We do lots of things before it's cool, sometimes way too long before it's cool. But it was still a cool thing to do, and it's a cool thing to do right now. Thank you, DYDX. Meanwhile, right? This is all the tech side. Meanwhile, this is how it's going. What was going on during this whole time? What were we talking about while we were developing this privacy stuff? What was happening in the world? Some of these may look familiar because I did put a couple of them up during my other Cosmoverse slide. You can see data privacy was a problem not just in the Web3 world, but it was a problem in the Web2 world. It was kind of a disaster in the Web2 world. But most of the examples that I were using, you know, it still didn't seem existentially bad. It was still just like, well, my data got leaked. And, and that wasn't really tangible enough for people. It wasn't visceral enough for people. There's too much removal from the part where it's like data is being exploited or leaked to the part where I feel that pain point as a user, as a developer. So all these examples are obviously atrocious, but they weren't that immediately threatening for those of us who live in like very developed countries in the Western world. Recently, it's gotten worse. So now in the Western world, maybe we don't have the same assumptions anymore about the importance of privacy. We have open source developers that are being jailed indefinitely with no real further details being released. We have the ability for data to be tracked even in the United States as this sort of political and legislative regimes shift. Will things like abortion still be legal? Will donating to Planned Parenthood become a crime that we can be prosecuted for after the fact? There's a lot of open questions around the things we took for granted. And suddenly people start thinking a little bit differently about privacy, not just in the Web 2 world, but in the Web 3 world as well. So suddenly I'm reading all these tweets, tweets that were kind of like unthinkable four or five years ago when everybody was telling us that we were crazy for having this privacy by default vision, for thinking that was the only sustainable model for decentralization and privacy coming together, that you couldn't tack on privacy after the fact as some kind of like mixer solution. You had to consider it at the base layer. We heard so many people tell us that that was very silly. And then they started tweeting about it like they were the first ones to think of it. Kind of ignoring, not just us, but all the builders in the space who had considered privacy a fundamental right and something that they had to be considered in the base layer of every application and network that was being built. So 
the long and the short of it is, re regardless of when you decide to care about it, regardless of when you decide to tweet about it, privacy has been needed all along, and it's especially needed now. Not just on paper, but in production. We need pragmatic solutions that can solve problems today, that push forward privacy for the entire Web3 space, that protect us in the Web2 world, that provide a meaningful alternative for users that they can start using and understanding and evangelizing. And especially good is if this is a solution that works with the rest of the blockchain world. It's not a silo that they have to opt into, but it's something that connects to all of the other blockchains. Every blockchain that they would care about, that they're already using, there's something connected to it that helps them understand the urgency and the importance of the privacy problem. So our focus is on pragmatism and adoption, because adoption is protection for privacy solutions. If there's an app that you have to opt into to get your privacy and not enough people opt into it, suddenly the government's going to say, you're using Tornado Cash, that makes you a criminal. But if billions of people are using encryption by default on, a, on something like WhatsApp, you can't call a billion people a criminal. And it's really hard to take away that fundamental right to privacy from those people because that fundamental argument starts to weaken. We're no longer all criminals, we're just exercising a basic human right. But that argument gets stronger only with adoption. Every vertical matters when it comes to adoption of privacy-enabled solutions. This is, people come up to me at conferences and they're saying, tell me something that privacy is useful for solving. And I always just immediately flip it around. I say, tell me something that you would use every day if you thought you could not have any privacy now or in the future. There's very little. And that's why the blockchain space has struggled to kind of scale beyond these speculative solutions, nobody wants to use anything more meaningful. Nobody wants to build on a public by default foundation because that's like building on sand. So every vertical matters and we want to see adoption from developers for privacy first applications across every single vertical and we want to see adoption on every single one of these verticals. But at the same time, we don't want to compromise on the same things that get things adopted. So as an ecosystem, we've started to put a renewed emphasis on things like wallets, fixing viewing key and permit models, all the tooling and documentation for developers, things that will actually allow users to adopt things that are privacy first, without assuming that means I have to have a meaningfully worse time using this thing. I'm giving something up for my privacy. Privacy is a public good. You should not have to compromise something like user experience just to protect your own security or just to have the guarantees we believe every user in the world should have. So to look at what we've got going on today in the secret ecosystem, I don't have time to go through all the mainnet dApps, all the dApps in, in, that are going to be produced that are coming across all these verticals. I'll feature a few because they're live and you can use them when you walk out of this room or while you're here. So we have a DeFi ecosystem. There's been over $3 billion in on-chain volume in secret DEXs. We've had tons of people coming into this ecosystem telling us they value privacy in their solutions. Whether that's for front-running resistance or transactional privacy, it's meaningful. So Sienna has built a whole suite of applications. They have a DEX, they have a lending product already usable on mainnet today. We also believe that privacy is essential for communications. So we have the Alter team that's built a private by default communications platform. You can message one-to-one, -one, you can join groups, you can authenticate yourself into joining private groups based on having staked something, done something, and it's all with these privacy protections that keep control in the hands of a user. It's a very Web3 native model that people may not know even exists and is building in the cosmos today. And then we have in the NFT side, platforms like Stash that are trying to extend this model of asset ownership of non-fungible assets. What if those had additional privacy protections? What if they could be private by default but you could reveal them when you wanted to prove ownership of something? What if they could have public or private metadata inside? What if you could rent access to the private metadata, have protected fields? Could you use this for things like home deeds? Could you use it for things like reputation in the real world or educational credits, anything at all? So that's already being explored on mainnet. And then what's coming is dApps for growth across every ecosystem. Because again, this is only meaningful with adoption. So how across all these verticals are we gonna get millions of users? There has to be something for people to look forward to. So Shade is already launching. Shade, some people in the room may know, they are launching an entire suite of DeFi applications directly on Secret that are all private by default. That includes uh, Silk, which is a private by default stable coin that is not US peg, but backed by a global basket of currencies and assets. They're also launching bonds. I believe today even is when they got some of their new bonds live. There's an Atom bond that they launched. These are the first bonds in the Cosmos ecosystem. 
and they're being built here today with privacy protections by default. They're also building a number of tools focused on stablecoin adoption, on-ramps, merchant payments. All of this is going to require privacy for consumers. We also have DAO tooling from Secret DAO. We have gaming platforms like OneNet that are going to secure private by default gaming applications with in-game assets, with true ownership, with imperfect information models. These are really exciting applications because they can lead to millions of users discovering the cosmos and discovering these privacy first solutions. And obviously I mentioned we need better onboarding if we want to get millions of users. We've gone from having a limited amount of wallet support to a dramatically large amount of wallet support in a short amount of weeks and months with projects like Fina and Leap and Starshell and Cryptic and I could name a lot more. Uh, also with Cato, you'll hear more about that soon, but all of this is essential for bringing users into the secret ecosystem and helping them discover privacy. So now, in our last minutes, I, I promised them that I would run over so we could get back on schedule. We were early, that's nonsense. This is the end of the beginning, so what's next? We recently completed the Shockwave Delta mainnet upgrade. This was huge, why? Because we got Cosm Wasm V1 onto mainnet, got to parity with these other incredible ecosystems that have already taken this step. So now it's never been easier for developers to start using secret contracts and building cross-chain applications. It also means that all tokens on secret, our SNP20 tokens, are also transferable across IBC, meaning you can bring them into osmosis and have pools for assets that started natively as tokens on top of secret. It also brings us to our privacy as a service vision meaning you can have cross-chain private smart contracts. This is essential to the Privacy Hub vision. You can have interchain accounts. You can have, I'd already mentioned the secret tokens going across IBC, but you understand why when I'm saying the whole vision is to have privacy and decentralization and interoperability and self-sovereignty, this upgrade is what finally unlocked that vision for the entire secret ecosystem and for the entire cosmos. I'm gonna quickly run through a few of some of the things that this would unlock for closer cross-chain relationships on Osmo, on Juno, whatever. I could have thrown like 800 logos up here because the Cosmos is growing so fast. But something like true RNG, right? this is possible today. Essentially being able to have true randomness in a decentralized setting through secret, callable by any chain. You can have things like private voting or better voting structures for Cosmos-based DAOs, whether they're native to secret or whether they're now on any IBC-enabled chain with interchain accounts. It's essential, I mean, the way voting works in the real world is you vote, you have aggregated numbers of votes, you understand that it was a provably correct outcome, but as soon as that's linked to your personal identity, during the voting process, now there's risks. There's a reason we don't do it that way. But maybe after the fact, you wanna be able to prove your vote, reveal your vote. These are the kind of programmable structures that are now possible when you have private by default smart contracts. Also, we're looking at a lot of different wallet innovation solutions. Meaning, could we have walletless experiences for users? People who have never used a Web3 wallet, how could they use a secret contract to manage their credentials so they never even have to know they're interacting with a Web3 application at all? And how could we combine what we're already doing with technologies like MPC to do better threshold wallets with multi-sig approval for transactions? There's so much more. There's so much more. I wanted to leave time at the end to talk about what's next, but there's so many more things that are possible some of which is already in active development. But everything that I'm just putting up here is not things you can build in two years, they're things you can build now. And over the hackathons that we'll be helping to sponsor over the next months, this is what we wanna see built, this is what we wanna see scaled for global adoption. Ultimately, it means there's endless possibilities. We're trying to expand this design space in Web3 a thousand X, because that's what privacy gets you when you have this programmably private foundation. Finally, this brings me to if this was the vision all along, then what could possibly be next? If we already got here, if we already have the programmable privacy vision, if we already have interoperability, if we already have this foundation, where are we going from here? What is Secret 2.0? I'm not ready to say everything about what Secret 2.0 is. I am ready to say what it's about. Ask yourself these questions and you'll understand our approach to Secret 2.0. Right now, we have built the very first programmably private smart contract blockchain interoperable throughout the cosmos with interchain accounts, cross-chain contract calls. So what can we do to strengthen some of these privacy guarantees? How can we go beyond this trusted hardware foundation and add technologies that strengthen guarantees for users, give developers choice, and strengthen this model? 
And if you're thinking of a privacy hub, is a privacy hub just a hub, or is it more like a constellation of stars than a single point of light? And how can we help secure not only the interchain ecosystem and every chain in it, but every chain beyond it? So these questions are already in active consideration. I will say there is something coming soon. This is a digital event. Don't feel like you got to fly back to Columbia, but I swear I'm going to be back here in like a month. It's beautiful. I never want to leave. I might not because there's a hurricane coming. So we will share details about Secret Summit. It's a digital event. Please RSVP for it because we will reveal a lot more. We will have a lot more interchain speakers. DAPs, it won't just be me yakking. It'll be everybody in the rapidly expanding secret ecosystem. If you want to get involved, build with us. We have a grants program. Incubator News is coming. Become a secret agent. Thanks to the three people who yelled in the room, but I'm sure there's 30 more. And lastly, we're looking for partners always now that we have cross-chain contracts. We have cross-chain relationships. Those matter more than ever because we want privacy on every chain. Take a picture of this if you want to get in touch. That's my Twitter, not my Telegram. My Telegram is actually this is Tor. It's not a secret, but I hate putting my Telegram on slides because I have 8,000 unread messages. Secret Network, SCRT.network is the website. Our Discord is the chat below. That's the Twitter for the entire network at large, not me personally, but they do respond to their DMs. Thank you for listening to me about privacy. Please prioritize privacy in your own solutions. Please reach out to us if you want to build with Secret and bring privacy to the whole interchain ecosystem. And thank you to Cosmoverse.